Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to the Institute of Healthcare Management's latest in its Health Chat series. And tonight we are thrilled to welcome Sarah Mitchell from the Local Government Association. Sarah is the Care and Health Improvement Advisor there, and we've been looking forward to this for ages. Without further ado, I'm going to hand on to Richard Strong from our sponsors, All Scripts, in just a moment. But if I may say to you all, if you would like to ask questions, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Do please use the Q&A facility or the chat facility in your tabs at the bottom there. But for now, Richard, over to you. Thank you, John, and uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, welcome to this health chat. Uh, with the upcoming uh, formalisation of ICSs and the ever-increasing recognition of the importance of, of an integrated approach to health and well-being planning and delivery of services, I think this, this health chat is really timely um, coming up now. So I'm really looking forward to, it, to, to what Sarah's got to say. I'm sure it's going to be fascinating. Uh, we're excited to sponsor and uh, over to Roy. Richard, thank you and good evening, everybody, uh, wherever it is you're watching. Um, I'm sorry we are still in Zoom mode. Uh, we didn't expect to be still Zooming uh, after all this time, and uh, we thought we'd be doing conventional conferences, but uh, hey, we're not. So if there's no, there are no plans to test the fire alarm this evening. So if you do hear a fire alarm, it's in your house and you better run. It's nothing to do with us. So Sarah, how are you? And have you caught COVID? I'm very well. And luckily, I haven't caught COVID because I know so many people have uh, suffered from it. And some more than others, some it's been much harder from others and they've lost people very dear to them. So I'm grateful that I haven't. We, I do live in Portsmouth in Hampshire, which is one of the highest rates, certainly was two weeks ago. So I'm very aware of um, the need to follow the rules and the constraints that are on us. And I'm also really aware of the pressure on our, our local system. So um, my hat's off to them and my heart goes out to them because I know people are really struggling. It's a, it's a real tough old time. And I just before it we is. came on air, I looked at the numbers. It's, I, I, uh, I forget now what it was, but it, it's more than yesterday. It's just they're just mm. the numbers are horrendous. Anyway, so look, I, I mean, the what we've learned, I suppose, really, uh, well, we've learned a lot. Haven't we? I mean, you're right to mm. point out the fact that COVID has been a disaster for so many people. But, you know, if we can take the the best of the past and take it into the future, we do know that a lot of things have improved. And mm. are, certainly on the IT front, things have, have gone on hugely i mean what do you think uh i mean for as long as i can remember I, there, there's a sort of golden period in my what is laughingly described as a career where i was the chairman of social services in, in local authority and the chairman of the health authority uh, and i have to say in that golden year when i was the chair of both i achieved absolutely nothing in trying to merge the two organizations closer together it's just impossible to do uh, that was a good few years ago. And I, do you think we're any closer? Do you think COVID's brought us closer? Well, actually, I do. And I'm a bit of an optimist, as people will know. So one of my staff once called me Pollyanna because I was so positive. But actually, I think uh, there are some real signs of people coming together. And OK, everybody says, oh, well, we always do in a crisis and we can't live our lives like that. But we I think the, the fundamental um, difference in the focus of the discharge arrangements on the individual, on the patient, on the person have brought people together uh, in a way that they haven't been able to before and like you Roy I have been doing this for donkey's years um, I actually was at um, Quarry House in Leeds in 1996 when we wrote the first um, detox recording sit rep form I'm really sorry because I regret it and we've been counting them ever since and actually the only time we've stopped since then has been because of Covid so <clears throat> that's a bit of a reflection but what it has meant is that people have come together there's no doubt that some of the arrangements we put in in March to sort of get some of the blockages out of the way the means test the the way that we were focusing on the community pull of people out of hospital has helped but actually in some places where relationships were really strained 
it helped people to get together and work together on this real common purpose. And that sounds a bit management speaky, but actually I've probably talked to, I would say at least 70 systems since March. And I would say that actually they are all um, largely saying that it has benefited those relationships in some way. Yeah, I, it, it is about relationships. It is interesting mm. that you say that because I was thinking as you were talking, I remember going up to Liverpool, I think it was, um, the, uh, and I was on a sort of uh, uh, older person's ward, geriatric care, <coughs> care uh, and at the time there was a big hoo-ha going on about discharge and getting people through the system and how we could I mean I suppose it's it's only COVID that's kind of blurred our memory of all that but it was a big thing mm, huge and I and I went up to see them because they didn't have any problems uh with it and I thought this you know how can this be uh I've read about it somewhere I rang them up and said can I come up and have a look and, and um when I got up there, uh, I said, how did you do it? And, and they say, this is how we did it. And they had, an, in a side room, they had a desk, a chair, a coffee mug and a computer. And it was, it actually belonged to the person in social services who worked on the ward. Mm -hmm. And it was all about personal relationships. Absolutely. And I thought, you know, and I've, I've worked in hospital social work most after my initiation into childcare, as we all do as social workers, um, all my life. And um, my mum was the matron of two hospitals, terrifying woman. Uh, all the nurses used to hide and I used to hide with them when she um, came on the ward when I was doing some uh, cleaning in the hospital. But actually, it, it's absolutely about those relationships and understanding different people's pressures and I'm not sure we do enough of that you know do do I really understand the pressure a junior doctors under uh, nurses are under and do they understand the pressures in social care or for therapists and I think one of the things that can help is if you've got the humility to say I don't know what your job is I'm going to come and you know not in the current world obviously but I'm going to shadow you I'm going to really understand what your day looks like and why it is that you might get really frustrated with me at a certain point and why it is that we're having a conversation that's going like that and we're not actually meeting. I think the other bit that we've seen in the systems where it works and I absolutely understand how hard it is, I'm not pretending this is easy, but actually modelling that really um, good behaviour from the top is so important. You can get people come together and they have really good discussions in multi-agency meetings but if the senior person in that organisation goes back into the trust, into social services, into the community or the CCG and says, well, we all know if only social services could get their act together or if only these doctors didn't do this, that's what then falls through the organisation and actually creates the tension at that, those lower levels that don't need to be there. No, I, I mean, I, I do agree uh, with that, Sarah, but it, but it does bring up the... The, the issue doesn't it that do we really want a, sy a system that relies on relationships and the sort of serendipity of people working together or do we want actually a system that just works because what we're really saying is that the system doesn't work but if people are bright enough to wriggle around and get around it work together and put the, the patient or the client first we can make stuff work I mean, I, it doesn't say much for the system, does it? Well, I think the new discharge arrangement and the focus on home first and uh, discharge to assess. And well, the, that, was, that was started uh, in the end. Years NHS. ago. Yeah. Years ago. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Started, I remember, you know, we run the Academy of Fabulous Stuff and we had the very first share on that. Somebody said we're doing discharge to assess and uh, Dr. Terry Porritt, who runs the academy for us showed him showed me and i said this is crazy you can't do that because you get lots of little old ladies sitting at home uh, social services will never turn up and they'll starve to death you, this is crazy so once again i went and had a look at how it worked uh, and it, i think it was in liverpool again and uh, i went up and had a look at it and it was brilliant absolutely yeah absolutely it, it all depended on the people uh, you know, we keep coming back to the relationships and I'm, I'm not saying that, that, you know, we shouldn't have good relationships. What I'm saying is, we, shouldn't we really have a system that delivers? But 
I would say we we have put the thought, and it's not perfect, I mean, uh, into what works. And the frustration that colleagues, we work really closely with colleagues in ESIS, emergency care support team, and other improvement teams as well. And the, the um, system, I mean, there is the whole issue about social care reform, and absolutely we would want to see um, proper funding and the issues addressed. But in the meantime, whilst that is in the long grass, actually what we're not very good at, and um, others may swear at me for saying this, is we put in place a new way of working, home first. We don't stop doing the old way of working. And actually the current time is a really good example of that because in COVID we said, right, no more delayed transfers of care. That's old language, old ways of working. But then people still do the things that they were doing before. And we're, we're not brilliant across systems at implementing new ways of working cohesively across a system. We're quite good at doing it within our own organisations when we're in control of that and we know how to do the management of change. But um, again, I agree with you, it can't all be about relationships and people, but actually empowering the staff, engaging them in the change, um, understanding, having the humility to listen to them when they say that's not going to work, um, and actually making sure that um, they are, have the delegated responsibility to get on with it as leaders. Um, that is what helps people to put in place the, the systems. Yeah, and if I, we I, just I'm not impose it, it doesn't work. No, I'm not arguing at all uh, you know, against a good leadership and good relationships. I'm just saying yeah. that, that what we've got now only works because people of good faith make it work and it's a bloody mess i mean it, it, we're talking about integration the at, at the at the bottom end of integration it's it's people having each other's phone number and talking to each other and making stuff work and at the other end it's either health running social care or social care running health so, or coming together and doing it together. Well, yeah. that's that's. I mean, that's the gamut, isn't it? Of, yeah. of, of it, and then somewhere in the middle is what you just described about people. But also, it's it's important well, that it's not it's not structural. That we, we we love a bit of restructuring and a structure. When actually, if you take a personalised approach, it's you know team around the person, whatever whatever you call it. Um, and that can work. And, you know, we know it can work because we are all, certainly I'm old enough to remember when it did work. I had my patch, I had my people that I was responsible for, and my best friends were my health visitor, my district nurse and my GP, who I talked to all the time about yeah. how we were supporting people. And I think there are opportunities, and again, I'm positive so but there are real opportunities with the pcns working with the community i want to teams. I, want to, I want to get on to that in a minute but i but i i, do, I want to just push back really i mean the, the, the punters don't care if it's health care or social care do they they just want to be taken care of uh and we still have I mean, it seems to me the fundamental stumbling block is this social care is means tested health care isn't means tested if we put the two together, how much healthcare ends up being means tested or how much social care becomes completely free and not means tested? I'm, I'm going to challenge you on that, Roy, because we keep thinking that if only health and social care were integrated, it would all work perfectly. Well, what we know, and I'm not criticising colleagues in the NHS because I love them, um, is that the NHS is a number of different organisations and the integration challenge is as much within the NHS and how the NHS works together as it is between health and social care. We just get really caught up um, on that. And where you have got good systems, where the staff are empowered, the money, the risk is shared, the leadership are really clear about what's their ambition for this population. They know their population, they know what will work. Actually, all those boundaries are blurred. Now, the and the only thing that does stick is the means test if you allow it to stick. But actually, if you work really well, and I've worked in systems where 80% of the older population are self-funders, uh, where you work effectively as joint commissioners, CCG and local authority, you're engaging your care market. I'm not saying it all goes away, but those sorts of things don't get in the way 
as much and so much that would lead you to say, right, we need a whole new restructure. And it's like anything that's a problem, if, if you allow it to be a real barrier. I mean, the, the bit about where the means test is applied has freed us up in COVID. So not making permanent long-term care decisions in an acute hospital is absolutely right. It's not fair on the person themselves, the patient. Uh, it's not fair on the family. There's all sorts of things that families need to consider. Let's just treat the acute episode as, an, as exactly that. It's not the place where you decide whether or not you're gonna sell your home. Move people out into those um, assessment home first settings. And that's where, if the means test continues and it's still law, so we, we can't change it, that's where you have that conversation and you don't fill up the hospitals uh, with, with people waiting for choice. And we've seen that in COVID, that isn't I think, happening. Yeah, I don't know, I don't agree. I think that just transfers the anxiety to another step. Um, it, it, you know, it's just not dealt with. Uh, at the heart of this is how we're going to fund social care in the future. Uh, Absolutely. And, and you've already used the expression, the long grass. I mean, I, I go back to when Frank Dobson was the Secretary of State for Health. I, I do. I, I work for him. You're a mere child and you could, could <laughs> possibly remember him. But, but uh, you know, I mean, he, he kicked the thing in the long grass because he didn't want to be a, a, the first socialist uh, to start charging people. I mean, it was all too difficult and it's all too difficult now. And after COVID, God knows how long it's all gonna to be too difficult. And so you've got the daft set of circumstances where your granny's in somewhere where you're paying two grand a, a week for her to stay there. And in the ne her next bedroom, her best mate is there by the local authority. And it's, it's they're paying, I don't know. It's and we have had some solutions. I mean, I was on the, I am old enough to have been in the team that supported the Long-Term Care Commission. And I was at DH when, uh, in 97, when um, uh, Dobson got in and others. But um, the, you know, Andrew Dilnot had a pretty good stab at this. And when I was um, a director in a large county with lots of self-funders, we invited him in to sort of test it out with a whole range of people. We had um, hundreds of people turn up to sessions with him to look at it. And Charles Tallock, who's at the um, Health uh, Institute now, was really um, helpful in looking at the analysis behind it. And that was a real opportunity that could have been taken. I can't even remember who was in uh, political power then. And so there are some solutions that are around to that. I don't think it's so desperate that there aren't any solutions. Why, it's about why, bravery. Why, why are we looking for complicated solutions? Because look, uh, 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 we all pay in towards the, the NHS, don't we? We all lo lob a few quid in the tin. If we get run over by a bus, the money's in the tin for us. If we don't, then we, if we don't we don't need it the money's in the tin for somebody else i mean that's the way it is elder care well, one thing's for sure we're all going to get old there's no surprise in that we've all got to fund elder we might be lucky and we might die on a golf course at 85 and not cost the state anything or we might because of a legacy of our jobs or lifestyle or where we live be frail and vulnerable and cost the state a fortune uh, but again, why don't we just put the money in the tin and say it's there if we need it? Why do we have to have this kind of, well, if you're over 40, there's going to be a special tax for this and a special tax. I mean, what is wrong with these people that they don't understand <laughs> syndicated, syndicated socialised care? Is it me? Uh, no, there's a very political question that I'm not going to answer. This is great, isn't it? You're invited on to talk about something. <laughs> he asks you questions about something else. Uh, what I would say, though, is we keep talking about social care as if it's um, all elderly care. And clearly it isn't. There are a large number of people with a learning disability or born yeah. with disability of a different kind. But, or yeah. who, you know, who, who well, that's, sadly that's have the other issue, isn't it? There's a lot of other people, not just older people, who... We yes. need to have a solution for everybody. Well, look at look at look at people with learning disability and families with uh, got the members of their families with learning disabilities. I used to run those services, uh, and I can tell you there is absolutely no reason at all 
generally to medicalize those services absolutely people do need medical care yeah, some people yeah. Need extra medical care but you know so do a lot of people need extra medical care so to to get it out of healthcare, i'm the devil's own job to to move you know we're for, you know sensibly functioning people with learning disabilities into their own environments you know and support them well, we've done that we did that with the transfer and um the people have continued to do that and actually that's where i come back to we do have policies and ideas and systems that we we don't always across health and social care follow through implementation of and if you take personalization that would be one of those things that both personalized health budgets personalized social care budgets some places do that really well and it's very empowering and people are in control of purchasing the care for themselves some places don't do it so well and if i were if i were powerful enough to be able to, to determine this. Actually, the focus on personalized budgets, cash budgets that people can use. And if you're, I'll just go off on a personal uh, road here. If you had that, particularly for children, so you had their education, their, per, their health budget, their social care budget, flexible and managed within the family, you would reduce the number of people who end up in those kind of residential or institutional settings who might have a learning disability and you could take that really good strength-based and community provision approach to keeping people uh, independent and at home but and so Sarah, Sarah that's that's not easy is it I mean it puts it's not easy onus. but it's doable places it puts, do it it puts, it puts a huge onus on the families that, that they're often really not able to cope with. I mean, I remember uh, going to- You can, uh, Roy, I'm gonna challenge you there. You can have managed budgets, you can have lots of different ways of doing it. It's not, it's not about dumping on families and having worked with a large number of families across a number of different places, not all in the same council area, they'd really welcome the opportunity to do that. I remember going to interview a family um, down in Kent, I think it was, uh, where they said, you just want to come and see. And um, they had on the taps, they had those stickers that said, this water is hot. You yeah. know? And uh, this was in their house. And I said, why have you got this? She said, well, because we employ people, it's health and safety at work. And so we have to fulfill all the health. I mean, they had a nightmare bureaucracy with, with doing it. I don't know, I know lots of you, for every example you give of where it doesn't work, there are lots of examples where it does work and it's about tailoring it to that family and that person there's no you can't say you know this works for everybody in this way it's actually but it is about giving people the opportunity to do it themselves if it doesn't work for them or if another solution is the right one but absolutely we we need to um, we talk a lot about personalised health and social care services, supported particularly now by AI solutions that I don't, you know, I'm no expert on that, but I know there's a number of solutions out there and a number of ways we can do it differently. But we always shy away from it's too difficult, people won't want it, it takes longer, it'll, you know, oh, will it be fraud, will people, I mean, certainly with individual budgets, that's what people are worried about, the incidences of that are minimal, and it's more cost effective, it's better for the person and their family, usually, um, and it's more cost effective, and, and we've, there's something about being brave about new ways of working and new models of care that sometimes because people are so worried about getting it wrong we don't follow through we don't do the change process we've had austerity really hit hard in local government i will say that because i'm a local government person that has meant that some of the things that frankly we were doing we put on hold because it's um, been harder when actually if we followed through particularly personalization it would be more cost effective in the end and better for people and that's what the d2a stuff has the home first mustn't say d2a um discharge to assess stuff has really shown in covid actually do you think that COVID, with long covid now which is something you know we've got to understand and get used to do you think that's going to put more 
of a stretch on social care? Oh, undoubtedly. And in fact, we've just been looking at some of the uh, long lengths of stay in hospital. And previously, you will have known, long lengths of stay would have equated to delayed discharges. Actually, people are staying in hospital a long time because they are really sick and they're not all over 65. And some of the things you know we're seeing in the media, but also we're hearing, again, I've probably talked to about eight systems this week um, about how it's working for them at the moment. And some of it is really distressing and we don't have the community capacity or even the type of community resource to support younger people for uh, with rehab, um, um, after they've had COVID with the psychological services, the mental health services, and the kind of um, community services um, once they're open again, that will enable people to get back on their feet. And it's- Well, you took, I mean, it's interesting, you just touched on, on the resource uh, implication. I mean, the NHS, uh, we've managed to disguise, or COVID has disguised the huge vacancy rate that there is in the mm. NHS nurses. Uh, I mean, they say mm. 40,000 nurses. Uh, Hancock was saying the other day, oh, we got 14,000 more nurses, probably. Yeah, but they forget to mention how many retired or dropped out this year. Um, we're running up the down escalator, probably 100,000 vacancies in the NHS one way or the other. What's the, what's the situation in social care? Um, well, I think, uh, sadly, in a way, COVID has attracted people into social care because they've wanted to help. That's good. And that is good. That is good. And I hope that people stay. And actually, um, you know, in terms of people going on social work courses, and so there's the social care workforce that support the care homes and domiciliary care, and the social work um, workforce that uh, uh, qualifies and and there are a lot of people in uh, on those courses and wanting to come through I think the difficulty is a lot of the resourcing of that in Covid is short-term funding we know that you know come March are we going to continue with this level of funding that enables people certainly the care providers have been able to pay higher rates because of the infection control grant and the other money that's gone in for them um, and are we going to have um, the ability to keep that level of resourcing going? And I would hope we would, because actually the crisis, if you if you want to talk like in the, that language, is going to shift to the community. There will be all those people who perhaps haven't had the attention that they might have done through the COVID uh, crisis and then there will be those people who would never have gone anywhere near social services um, previously but because they've caught COVID and it's really impacted on their lives either their physical or mental health or indeed their employment and their household situation economic situation that actually will need support and I'm not sure we've got enough in the community to be able to cope with that. I'm wondering too I mean it, you're going to need a a hell of a lot more people aren't you it, it it the and you know the wages as well I mean, do, do you, let me ask you do you think care homes could have managed the covid the initial covid issues better i don't think there's any value in that judgment uh, uh of any part of the sector actually um and okay, i let, think let me, that... let me rephrase it i'm not being critical i i i, I think uh, it was a bit of a shorthand for a, a longer question. Yeah. Let me put it another way. Uh, I mean, care homes uh, offer, uh, and I don't mean this to be in any sense derogatory, but they offer a basic level of care for a level of acuity and needs, you know, within the care home sector. But, but you know, people in care homes are getting older. Uh, there used to be a difference between care home and a nursing home. Now you can't transfer one between the other because of the, the finance situations and places and all the rest of it. I mean, clearly a higher level of nursing care is needed across the average of, of, of normal care. And the care homes weren't really versed in uh, uh, infection control or, or, or they didn't have the PPE. I mean, they, they just were unprepared to act as a nursing home at a time when a lot of people did need at least superficial nursing home care in a care home environment. I, I mean, that's about the regulators and the CPS. Yeah, they're not registered to do that. Yeah. I, mean, do you, I, I think, I guess, no. what, I guess what I'm saying is, do you think we could we should try and leverage up the um, care homes to 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 offer a, 
a, a level above the, the in inverted commas care home care that they offer now well i think there's something about um there is a new approach to commissioning care that needs to come out of COVID. And I think the, the first point is how many people have gone into a care home when they could have actually gone home and they probably wanted to go home. And if we had the wraparound services for that initial 72 hours or even a couple of weeks to get them home with the kind of support that you can get to, to protect people as smart homes and all that kind of stuff at home, then actually I think you would have seen that you would see a lot more people choosing to go home. I I've closed residential care homes in the past um, and a lot of those people say do you mean I didn't need to come here there's been an alternative and the increase in extra care and really very good living care and supported living at home um, is is where we need to expand supported by community health and primary care the question then is what's the cohort and i hate that word but it, it explains it of people who then need 24-hour care in a bedded setting and um, there is a question about whether you need bog standard residential care anymore and forgive me for that expression but actually looking at what the nursing care offer is now in in nursing home care is really crucial and how much of that needs to be dementia care, how much of that needs to be um, uh, tailored to particular physical needs, and how much is it for very um, high acuity, um, very dependent people. And I did, um, you know, I was a nurse at one point, and we used to look after people who were really, really poorly, quite catatonic, um, just needed a lot of TLC and there is there will be an increasing number of people but I think it's about that flexibility again and that quality and we only get we've got to be able to pay people the right rate but that's got to be funded it can't be a battle between local authorities and care providers it's got to be properly funded people have got to be um, properly trained and, and want to do that and it's got to be valued I think the parity of esteem argument at the moment it's a it's difficult because a lot of people will go and see a GP not everybody will see someone in social services but in some international countries other countries you know in um, New Zealand and Australia and some Scandinavian countries being a social worker working in social care is something that people are really proud of and um, and they're supported to do and people think it's a really good career to have I mean, the only time I haven't, um, you know, said at a dinner party that I'm a social worker was when I was a civil servant. And I continued saying I was a social worker because actually that was better. But it's that thing about valuing it. If we mm. value it, we'll pay for it. And actually, yeah, we, we value we, it. Others we've will got pay a race for it. to the bottom, haven't we? I mean, a couple of years ago, it was revealed that Birmingham were actually auctioning bundles of people with the same levels of acuity to be looked after in care homes and it, you know, that was a race to the bottom and guess what we're going to employ people on the minimum wage we can get away with to look after people like that i mean do you, do you, i mean it is argued isn't it that there should be a national uh, uh, fee for for care mm. home residential mm. care home or domiciliary care home so we say okay this is the amount we're going to pay and this is exactly what we're going to get for it do you think we should leave it to the market well it's an interesting one and care providers will argue this much more than i do but i i know um from having been a commissioner with a very large budget to commission care it's very different even in the south of england the difference between councils in terms of market prices, land prices, um, uh, labour market prices, it's all very, very different. And if you're going to do that, then you have to look at what the, who the winners and losers are in that and whether or not you're doing in your doing that you're investing in different parts of the country in different ways. So that is it is a very complicated market. And I think. It's very frustrating, particularly for health colleagues, because they don't operate in that market and therefore, you know, it's much more prescribed what do nurses get paid, what do healthcare assistants get paid. So it's really hard to understand. But before we go down that road, which could cost a lot of money, let's work it out first and make sure that we're we're investing our money in the right place. And um, 
and but, I come well, back look, to Sarah. You've you've been a commissioner, and you know, you know, I've got a hundred quid to buy domiciliary care. You know, ten hours of domiciliary care. You know, how do I? And I need twelve hours. So who's going to do twelve hours for a hundred quid? I mean, it, it simplified it, but you know what I mean. Uh, uh, you, you've got a fixed budget. You've got more people coming into the system all the time. It, it drives the the uh, uh, the payments down. That drives the, the the costs out of the system, and it and it it's just a race to the bottom, isn't it? Well, that's why I come back to personalisation as the way forward. And again, people might not think that's the way it works, but if you are working with someone, if you were looking at how they live their lives, the risks that they want to take the way they want to live. And then you design a package with them and a support package that's maximizing their opportunities. Then actually you're gonna spread that hundred pounds over around a lot more people. And what you're also gonna get, no, right, I'm gonna finish my point here. I feel like I'm on radio four, but I'm gonna do. do. What you also get is a better outcome for that person and a much better relationship between that care worker and that um, person that they're working with i just i think you're coming at this from a kind of middle class view i i, I go back to when the duchess was alive my mum you know and she needed care at home I, I pretty much stopped work to look after her but there's certain things a son can't do for his mum so you need some help i it, me you know with all the contacts that i've got in health and social care i didn't know where to begin to find somewhere that was any good. So I asked around, asked the day center, who's anybody, who's anybody any good, you know, and say, oh, well, my one mom's looking after the blah, blah, blah. In the end, I mean, you just, I just got somebody in. First time they sent a nurse, she turned up, walked in, smelt cigarettes, I showed her the door, you know, and then I thought, well, what now? Again, Roy, what? for every poor example of care, there's always a good one. And actually, that is one thing that I will agree with you on. We're not very good at communicating what we do, except some places. I've seen fantastic information, you know, packs of information when you go into A&E. This is what's going to happen to you. This is what these people are for. This is what this is called. As soon as we know you're admitted, this is the date you'll be discharged. And it all flows. And there are really good examples. And there are some fantastic examples of um, uh, personal assistants who work really well with people and it works superbly. And there will always be in any industry. There's well, something okay, well, that okay, well. I've just got an eye on the time. So let's just sum up to where, where we are. We've got an underfunded, disaggregated service that depends on the potluck of people being able to work together. Yes. No, I totally did. I mean, the underfunded bit, I totally agree with you. And actually, you know, if if anything, COVID has shown is the real value of our public services and local government, whether it be. Yeah, but that, hang on. Wait, that's because we've really just sent, sent the bill to Rishi, haven't we? Whatever it is at the moment, nobody cared to just say, fix it, give Rishi the bill. Eventually, Rishi's got to find the money to pay the bill. And isn't there? And I'm no politician and I'm I'm not going to get into the political argument. But then there's a question back. And I know people are, I'm going to say they're starting to clap at some point tonight. That's the bit about how much are we individually all prepared to pay to get high quality public services? And given, you know, we've seen we we spend money on things and I may be middle class and whatever, but actually a lot of people, I think, given the choice, would be prepared to pay and actually you know we don't we send all our bills to Rishi and he can choose what he spends it on can't he and I'm getting a bit well, no, not any chancellor <laughs> any <laughs> chancellor can choose whatever their colour <laughs> uh, to the spend their money uh, if I was Rishi I'd be nailing up the letterbox at number 11 I tell you okay no, right. But Roy, remember there's people out there and I've been one of them directors of adult social care who have saved millions in yes, the last 10 years millions and done really difficult things and actually all the evidence shows that people have still had a good service now that doesn't mean that we don't need that money because we could have been doing it for millions more and I think one of the things uh, that are really going to uh, be um, noticeable after COVID is just how many people will need to access those services. So that's, not that's, that's listen, Sarah, per person. Sarah, that, that's what numbers. worries me. No, I'm, just, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, okay, so all right, we agree it's a mess. Um, 
so so here we go sarah mitchell uh welcome to my cabinet you are now the secretary of state for social care and all the rest of the dinky do that goes with it all um what do you want to do uh, I'm going to be really boring and go back to services around the person, really local, place-based, combined, aligned, whatever, integrated, whatever you want to call them, professionals and uh, care assistants and healthcare assistants working together around that person. That's where you'll see your efficiencies. Um, I think there's something about um, uh, one of the things we have learned in COVID, and this is quite contentious, but actually... Uh, absolutely agreeing what needs to happen but for goodness sake let the local systems get on and do it the local services and because actually where we have done that it's been really successful so there's no point in paying for all this um, service all the, the size of the NHS and local government if then when something like this happens you don't trust them to get on okay, with it. But so so we know that we're in exceptional funding times now so what what do we do I mean given the health inequalities that COVID has exposed how how do we go about a, a, a new funding model uh, to take into account the huge variation there is in, in health inequalities up and down the country? I mean, do we do we ask somebody to come up with some kind of a better formula than the one we've got now? Uh, I mean, how, how do we do that? I mean, clearly, I think local government has performed magnificently, particularly Absolutely. they've used the private sector very sensibly. They've done, you know, competitive tendering. I mean, they've done everything they can. They've reorganized. God knows how they've managed to keep going, but they have. Uh, I mean, do I suppose what I'm saying is, do we need a more sensitive funding model? Um. I think my thing would be, and I, I am going to be boring and come back to that place based stuff, because actually your point about the inequality is a really important one. And we have seen how COVID has hit different communities in different places really hard. And actually, are we being driven by the knowledge and need in that community? We talk a lot about being driven, you know, by knowing what our health needs are in any population and actually our social care needs and our other economic needs. I'm not sure that that does inform and drive uh, the funding uh, formula and mechanism that we need. It's probably pretty old fashioned in terms of things like number of elderly population houses without heating. I don't know, it's, it's all been updated since um, I was looking at it in, in detail in relation to where my pockets of deprivation are. But I, I am an absolute fan of our public health colleagues and worked really closely with them in developing things like joint strategic needs assessment and actually them understanding what the different communities might need. And I'd love to see a much more bottom up yeah. um, way of doing well, it. Well, it is interesting, isn't it? I mean, public health were effectively kicked out of health and shoved up the back passage of the town hall and they complained like hell because they didn't want to go there. A lot of them actually now quite like working in local government. And it's if ever a profession's time has come, it's now. Absolutely. And superb. They are really um, fantastic at helping. They, they bring the other side to the coin when you're looking at the social care commissioning bit well, with their the CCG link, coin. The right. link point between health and social care. I think that they, they are the linch point. I would give them the money and decide how to spend it, to be honest. I, I really would. So it doesn't look, need to be one or the other. It, we can all work together, you know. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I know, but it depends on the personalities. What about the shared <laughs> care record? It's got to be in by September. Is that going to be done? I don't know whether it's going to be done. I, I'm absolutely um, keen on people sharing information. And I was um, talking earlier about a council um, not too far from where I live in Portsmouth, <laughs> who actually have got really good access to each other's information. And that works really well. Um, and social workers and um, GPs really like that. And so do people who go to see either of them because actually they're not repeating loads of different questions and they think, oh, these people talk to each other and they know what they're doing. Well, it's all so, been free. It's been free up to COVID, that. isn't it? I just, we were talking to Matthew Gould uh, this morning and one wonders really the extent to which we're going to have to go back where we were. Why don't we ask Richard? I mean, uh, Richard's with us uh, this evening. Um, Richard, 
I, I mean, what what is what is the industry? What is this, this software industry? Your industry? What has it got to offer, really? The the sort of predicament that health and social care find ourselves in. What could what could you do that we're really not doing very well and struggle to do together? Well, I think it, it comes around you know the technology support to to make data and information available at the point you need it. Um, you know, the example that Sarah gave is, is a great one, but it's about the people and how they use that technology. What we can do is provide that technology, connect it together in a seamless way that whether you're a, you know, a social worker, whether you're a GP, whether you're someone in, in uh, accident emergency wanting to know what's happened with the patient, we need to give and serve up that information in their workflow in the way they do it. And we can absolutely yeah, I, do that. I, I think that's an important point. I mean, Sarah touched on just as we started our conversation, she talked about uh, artificial um, intelligence, AI, of which there is no such thing. Uh, and won't be for the next 20 years, but there is machine learning. But there's a lot that we could do with data, I think, um, Sarah, or, or well, and Richard, really, to, to, to take, I mean, at the moment, we're living in a blizzard of, we, we're like living, you know, those desk things where you turn them upside down and shake them and all the snow things come. We're living in the blizzard of COVID and not, none of this is very clear, but it will settle and we will have good data, better data that we still don't really use between us, I think, for forecasting and for funding and all kinds of things that if it was a business, we would use. Um, and I think, well, I'll ask you both really, what, what was, I'll start with Sarah. What do you think is the role of data as we move forward, Sarah? So interesting because I think it helps you ask the right questions and we've been um, doing some sessions with places uh, where the new discharge um, uh, guidance data criteria to reside, um, the pathway information and the destination stuff is all there to, to, to help you understand what's happening in your system and where people might be falling through the net or getting stuck. And it's about how you have a, a, a data set that you all feel confident is accurate, because unless it's um, people feel confident is accurate, they're not going to pay any attention to it or you're just going to spend ages arguing about it. And then it helps you ask the, the right questions. So why have we got, I don't know, these number of people who have been stuck in hospital for 21 days? Why have we got too many people going into care homes? Why have we got a, a large number of people being readmitted at any one time? That's what it's uh, helpful for. And, you know, it's not helpful if it's used as a performance management tool to bash people with or to make people feel insecure because actually they'll just fill in anything that gives you the right answer and you know we have had we have had examples of returns to the to the center where little swear words are put in to see if anybody's read it um or they've deliberately done something that's totally outrageous and nobody's picked it up because actually all this production of data um has not been used appropriately i think yeah, you're right I, I i mean i could admit this now but years ago when i was running a hospital we stopped submitting kerner data and no one noticed uh so, exactly you know so Richard, what can you do with local data? systems what can you do with data now that we're not doing so I think what Sarah says is absolutely right. It shouldn't be about you know just measuring people. It's about what the data can tell you. I think the really exciting things that we can do going forward is really much more around the predictive analytics. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and that's kind of using machine learning to use your terminology. Well, I, I agree, it's not really artificial intelligence. But you know when you can start bringing all that data together and including things like environmental factors, what's the pollution levels, what's the pollen counts and all those sorts of things, what's the weather going to be like? You can then proactively build into people sort of uh, alerting and workloads. Well, actually, these particular people that you've got in your in your cohort of patients or, or citizens are likely to need have these extra needs because of the, the environmental factors, the pollen, whatever it might be, and, and adjust the way you engage with those people. Yeah. And also the socioeconomic factors, you know, if we know unemployment is going to be an issue because of all the things that have happened, you know that that will have those knock on effects. Um, and I think that's it's useful to play those in as well. I, th I think that's for me, that's the exciting bit. Um, you know, once, as I say, once we get beyond the blizzard of of uh, COVID, the, the exciting, but we, it, we, in a sense, 
we've had a, a kind of a breakthrough with with technologies we, we've done more with technologies in the last four months than i've seen us do in the last 40 years uh, and you know there's, there's going to be a, a, a bigger trust of technology i think a bigger appetite from the public to use technology in the interface with services and maybe this is this is the breakthrough I, i'm going to hand uh, back to john in a minute for uh, for some questions but before i do so uh, okay paint is a picture sarah Take us beyond COVID, if 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 any of us can think that far ahead now, um, and and you know, okay, so we've not been great at working together. It's, there's been pockets of it of, of great exemplars, and I've travelled around the country and I've seen a lot of it for myself. I know it can work. So, so what I mean, what, what are we looking for? Really, what are we aiming for? What what would you say? You know, if if we sort of got to this point, then that's where we really need to go from. Okay, so what does good look like is, is what you're asking in terms of um, the individual empowered to be able to live in the way well, that they I mean, want to I live. Meant, I meant more really the relationship between health. Yeah, and, and health I was going to come to that actually because yeah. I would absolutely disagree that there are um, pockets. There is a huge amount of really good working. And one of the things oh, we pockets. need... Big no, pockets. no, Roy, I'm going to challenge you on this. Um, we need to dispel the myth that actually the health and social care system isn't working. Uh, it might not be working as well as it could be, but there is an enormous amount of really effective good work going on out there. Now we might have some of the metrics wrong by which we measure it. And COVID is a difficult place to be to judge that, but we absolutely have to dispel the gloom myth that it's all not working because there are lots of systems and lots of places where it's working really well, whether it be around the discharge from people from hospital or whether it be in the community. And, there are, and that's the place where I think we'd want to see it. People, you know, it's a negative thing. They're not admitted to hospital unless they absolutely need to be. They're not, um, you know, in crisis. They are able to access services uh, when they need them and they are responsive. But if you want that to happen, if you want people to be well supported in the community and not using um, institutions inappropriately, you have to fund it. And one of the things that much as I would push for local government funding, actually what happened in, I think it was 2012, when community services were tendered for, that was saw a real dip in the level of funding for community health services. And I would really want to see that leveled up with social care as well, because that's right, because, where it's gonna yeah. work. Because then we had the Better Care Fund to bail all that out. Well, and the Better Care Fund is, is limited in terms of the money. And actually you can't run services based on a grant that's you no. know, annual, annual, no, exactly. annual. Yeah, top Got up. to be properly yeah. funded. And, yeah. and one of the things we are doing post COVID is looking at, so what is the model of community care that works? I mean, again, probably people aren't old enough to remember national service frameworks for various yeah. different care groups. But actually that was really clear. You know, this is what you need to have in place well, in your community. Do you see national service, do you see, or national service frameworks of a sort coming in now with integrated care services because they're not. I mean, the CCGs are going to go. Uh, we're not going to. We're not going to be competing. I mean, Simon Stevens made that very clear. We're not going to be competing for services in the way that we did. They're not going to go out to tender. So all you can look for is some kind of service framework. Yeah, and models of care. There's there's lots of things around that you could use the terminology, but being really clear with people what good looks like in community provision integrated with PCNs and, and uh, others is really important. And I just saw the, the comment that comes up that um, social care is really disjointed and fragmented. We keep focusing on social care. And all the time we come up with those sorts of comments about it, people aren't gonna come and want to work in social care. People aren't want, going to want to do the really difficult jobs. We've got to start talking it up and not talking it down. And the NHS is totally different to the um, social care and local government responsibilities. We can't try and pretend it's the same. We've got to adequately adequately fund and resource both and value both because until yeah, we do I, yeah, I we agree. will continue to have this situation yeah so social care isn't isn't health without a blue light it's an absolutely it's yeah. completely different 
John, um, uh, do you want to take us through a couple of questions? Yeah, we've got, <coughs> forgive me, we've got plenty of um, uh, comments in the chat zone and plenty of questions as well. So I think if we could ask the, the sort of responses to be fairly short so we can try to get through as many as we can. Uh, Jane says, does Sarah have any views on the future of integrated care? What one big change would be in her dreams? Oh. Um, big change would be would be co-locating um, community health and social care teams to work together because there is no doubt and we've we've noticed it a bit with the zoom culture we've all teams culture we've got into working together really works in terms of having those informal conversations those uh, ways of working so um, if you're designing it actually giving those people the opportunity to physically work together and have that communication yeah. That's really true. I've seen it for myself. It's one of the most important things. Get mm. in the same office with the same coffee mugs and the same hobnobs. <laughs> okay, Tracy asks, do you have a view on genuine co-production as a system enabler? And you oh. have talked very passionately about this during the session. Would you just give us a final comment in that regard? Absolutely. And um, I've learned some hard lessons by not doing proper co-production, thinking, oh, here you are. This is what I think. What do you think? Actually having that with staff as well as with um, people uh, in your population, um, that really does drive the better solutions. And there's nothing more disempowering as a nurse or a social worker having the greatest, the latest chief whatever they might be just saying oh I know how this works I did it in this last place if you could just all change to do this without listening and having the humility to 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 hear what people think locally Great yes and, and I think also uh, I, I, I'm not sure John if you might be coming to this but there's a, a thing about um in the in the questions is about the the shared use of resources so you know yeah are, yeah used as uh, social care. I mean, there's a legal reason why that is often difficult. But uh, if people, well, Section 75, I think now it enables it, doesn't it, for health and social care to and share. delegated budget. budgets, yeah. You can do it if you want to do it. Yeah. Sorry, John, go on. No, that's fine, that's fine. Um, okay, I'm going to come to Phil, who says, he, sa he says, this all sounds insurmountably depressing. Give me three <laughs> good news stories. Or three great action areas so that Phil doesn't give up. Well, okay, the so first thing, Phil, is to go to Waitrose and buy yourself a bottle of Penderin because <laughs> uh, it's on special offer at the moment. So I've heard people, so, um, okay, one place, I won't mention them because it wouldn't be fair. For years, they've really struggled and people have been stuck in their hospital for years. We uh, talked with them this week, dramatic changes. And it had all been about actually facing each other and saying, this is not good enough. We're not doing the right thing and getting together and doing that. So that's one example I've had this week. Um, and another example, and I, I used this from a few years ago, but actually it, it speaks to the bit I was talking about personalization, was a woman with dementia who wanted people wanted to put into a care home. Someone um, talked with all her friends and family and said, what is it that she loves? And the two things she loves was being in a hairdresser's because that's where she'd worked and going dancing because that's what she'd done with her husband. And they used the money um, to a, for her to um, go into this particular hairdressers and potter about, it sounds patronising, but you know what I mean, and actually to go and sit on the edge of some dancing classes that were happening locally. That woman's life was transformed and she carried on living with relatively lower levels of care and didn't get put into a care home. Those are the sorts of personalisation examples. And the other bit I'd, had, I'd say is we've been doing some peer reviews with a system uh, many miles away, and actually uh, giving the opportunity, and I know you'll think this is all airy-fairy, for the system of operational leaders to take two hours out a fortnight to just talk about what's happening without an agenda, without a script, without feeling they've got to represent their organisation has been really refreshing for them and enabled them to start to have very different conversations. And only because someone said it's okay to step back and spend a couple of hours thinking and talking mm. and bringing my knowledge and expertise to this session without having to think about, oh, we must do this by then. 
to produce that. Yeah. Re reflective practice. Good exactly. idea. I've got, I'm going to yeah. do two and final just, questions yeah. before we finish, if I may. Oh, yeah. Can I just say, John, uh, uh, to, Phil, have a look at the Academy of Fabulous Stuff. There's no loads yeah. of great examples. Yeah, brilliant there. stuff on there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. so I'm going to do two final questions, one from Justine and I'm going to do one from Grant. Justine says, does Sarah agree that learning from negligence claims has a role in social care too? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And from anything, you know, from any safeguarding things, other things that happen, we've all been there with really difficult things. And if we don't learn from them, they just happen again and again and again. And, and again, you've got to be humble. You've got to be, have the humility to say sometimes we get it wrong. And but sometimes we can learn. It, you have to do it in such a way that people aren't f frightened of being struck off or sued. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. We, haven't, we haven't got that right. Not by a long chalk. No. Okay, and final question then from Grant. Should ICSs be contained within a legislative footing or be developed as a partnership with local government having equal representation and parity to strengthen local democracy for oversight. Well, this is this is in the uh, uh, the uh, consultation document that's, is that's the just come out. And if you hunt around, uh, John will probably tell us where it is. But we did a, a health chat with that the other night to discuss it. I'm not sure how far we got, but it's it, this is extremely difficult. Who asked this question? This is Grant. Grant, I don't know who you are, Grant. You must, you're a plant, I think. <laughs> you're, Grant the plant. No, he can't be. Grant the plant. You've got you. Can, you're giving us the most difficult question right at the end. Uh, anyway, what does Sarah think? Well, I'd be curious what Sarah thinks. Yes. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'd want to see local government um, having a strong voice, but not, um, but not controlled by because it's really important that's an equal partnership. What I would say is that I think we underestimate the value of health and wellbeing boards. And when we set those up originally with CCG colleagues and GPs, actually um, there was some really good work done through the health and wellbeing boards and conversations between um, council members, uh, members of the council, the po politicians and GPs and directors of public health and um, directors of children and adult services that really began to set out what's the what's the ambition we've got for our local population and I wouldn't like to see that lost in any ICS development. Mm. I th and I think there's a bit about the geography as well. Absolutely. Co-terminosity of the geography, I think, is really important. Absolutely. And, and if we're going to get it right, then the ICS, some of them are enormous compared to local authority boundaries. We've got to get the place bit right. Yeah. And some of the stuff that we did do with PCGs and CCGs is really get that really good local government um, CCG yeah. commissioning right at that local level. Well, so we they don't want to lose that. on the STP footprints, and they were just a really uh, serendipitous infill, uh, you know, they, I, I think actually, Grant, you'd, we'd, we'd need to do a whole program on this. And, uh, <laughs> Not with me, well, we've, got, we've got our integrated care conference coming up. No doubt it will be discussed there as yes, well. Make sure you're there, Grant. I'll be looking for you. OK, we need to end well, it there, I'm afraid, yes, Roy. I, can I just say um, uh, first to, to Richard uh, from All Scripts, thank you so much again uh, for your support of... Uh, of these events we can't do it without you so we're really grateful and thank you very much and to sarah i don't know where the time's gone i, I, love you. I just <laughs> i've so enjoyed talking to him being beaten up by you i don't think i've ever been beaten up by someone so charming uh and i'll get you back next time i see you but okay no, that's good it's been it's been really good uh, and i think it, uh, i've really enjoyed talking to you and and thank you so much and uh, listen keep safe and good luck Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I do hope you enjoyed that. Box office, always on our Health Chat events. And Sarah is only the very latest in a series of wonderful guests. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you to Richard at All Scripts for their support. Thank you to Roy for his questioning. I do hope you enjoyed the debate. The next Health Chat is actually on the evening of the 14th uh, of January uh, to coincide with the uh, integrated care conference that takes place that afternoon. In the evening, we have the fabulous Michael Adamson, CEO of the British Red Cross, to talk to us all about the third sector and their very vital role in all of this. But for now, thank you very much for watching. Do hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you.
Good night.